Well, good morning, everyone. Good to be with you. Going to uh, talk today about the tabernacle. I think we've got the... There we are. Yeah, just before I start, we have got the latest edition of Light for Last Days, on the, uh, which will be mailed out on Wednesday, and there's copies on the table if you want to take them after the service. Uh, let's just have a word of prayer as we come to the uh, Word of God. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you're with us always, even to the end of the age. Thank you that we can know that your presence is with us now. Pray that you bless the preaching of your word and bless the congregation, those who are here, uh, those online who are here, and that all things that we do may be glorifying to you to build up our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I'm sure you agree we live in difficult times, all kinds of things going wrong all kinds of troubles coming upon us, and sometimes we can focus on the troubles, but I want to focus today on the solution, which is Jesus. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who has come in fulfilment of prophecy, who is coming again, also in fulfilment of prophecy, and who came the first time to redeem us, to save us from our sins, to give us eternal life and forgiveness as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the interesting things when you study the Bible is you see so many types of Jesus in the Old Testament. He didn't just come out of nowhere. It's there in the Hebrew Scriptures. There are prophecies directly of Jesus, and there are types of Jesus. And I want to talk today about one of those great types of Jesus, which is the tabernacle. We've got a little model of the tabernacle here. Before we can't see it very well. Q1, show it to us. But you can see a picture of it there. <laughs> uh, and we'll put it on show afterwards. You can have a look at it. No, maybe not. My back is just lifted up. There's a model of the tabernacle. Not really. Now just skins over it. So inside, where you have all the items of the tabernacle. Really. I'll leave this out so people can have a look at that after the service. Uh, actually, I'm really continuing the series we did on Exodus last year. Uh, and one of the things we saw about the book of Exodus and the connection with our passage through the wilderness of this world is that there are many things which the Israelites experienced, which also we experience and which we can learn from as we apply them to our lives in the Lord. In fact, the last time I spoke about Exodus, we actually looked at the golden calf incident. And remember, at that time, Moses had gone up to the mountain to commune with God, and God was giving him further commandments after the Ten Commandments, instructions on how to live in the light of his commandments. And he's also giving him specifically details about the tabernacle, about the priesthood, the offerings and the furniture in the tabernacle, and all of these things were about how we access God, how we come to God. And one of the things which you read when you look at the Bible is the whole story of the Bible actually is that there is God who is holy, there's us who are not holy, and how is God going to bring the two together? Because God actually loves us and he wants to have fellowship with us and he wants to come amongst us and to dwell with us. There's a problem from our side because we are sinners, uh, because we are separated from God because of sin, Indeed, as our sister read earlier, uh, the cause of the problems of the world is because your sins have made a separation between you and your God. Uh, it's not what God wants, it's what is the reality of the situation. And there's a problem from our side, there's also a problem from God's side. Because God, who is holy, cannot have fellowship with sin. So from God's point of view, he actually can't come to relate to people while they're still in their sins, while they're under the power of Satan. Uh, there has to be some provision from God's point of view which will cause us to be able to come into God's presence and have fellowship with him. And when you look through the Bible, you can see that this idea of God wanting to have fellowship with us, to dwell with us, to live with us, is part of God's plan uh, from the beginning, that God created us in the image of God. It was because of sin that the separation came in. But in the tabernacle, we have uh, one of the ways in which God says he wants to come and dwell with us. He says uh, in Exodus 25, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Uh, so God says the purpose of this sanctuary is that God may come and dwell and live with us. 
And we see that as we go into the New Testament, Jesus came as the Word made flesh, the Word of God, who is God. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus being incarnated and coming into the world was actually God coming to dwell with us, to reveal something about God to us. And having come into the world and died and risen from the dead, then God, Jesus, ascends to heaven and sends the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is to come to dwell in the church, so that the church should be the dwelling place of God. And Paul describes this very well in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, where he says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, having built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a temple, holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. You see that? You are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Uh, in fact, the purpose of the church is not to have a nice building or a nice organization. It's to have a body of people who are called out of the world through whom God can dwell by the Spirit. Uh, so God actually wants to dwell with us here, not because we're in this building, but because we are ourselves part of the building. We are the children of God. We are born again by the Holy Spirit. God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit so he can come and dwell with us uh, as we are here on the earth and be his special people who are called out. So God wants to, us to be built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And of course, ultimately, uh, God's purpose for his redeemed people is that we go to heaven to be with him and to dwell with him for all eternity. Uh, Revelation 21, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And that is the glorious prospect for those who believe in, in the Lord. So you're going to be with God forever in heaven. He's going to dwell with you, and you're going to dwell with him. And you're going to live with him and be his people. So God loves us. God wants us to have a relationship with us. He wants to come and dwell with us. He wants to uh, be, as it were, our, our friend, but more than our friend, our saviour, our Lord, but the one who's bringing us all together in him. But he's prevented from doing this by the presence of sin and by the power of the devil. So if people are under the power of Satan and are in sin, then there is a barrier between us and God. And from God's point of view, he can't trust that barrier. Uh, and from our point of view, we can't cross the barrier either. So it remains there. So the whole point of the Bible from the beginning to end actually is to remove that barrier and to bring us into fellowship with God. And we see that this is part of the tabernacle, is part of the process of doing this, uh, part of the giving of the Torah, the giving of the law through Moses, and through then giving the sacrifices, the priesthood, and the building the tabernacle to make it possible that we can come into his presence, that actually not us, the Israelites, in that case, could come into the presence of the Lord, which would be a type of how we come into the presence of the Lord through faith in Jesus. And the tabernacle was part of the process of making this possible. Now, I can imagine that there is also someone who wants to stop this happening, and that's Satan. Uh, Satan's whole strategy from the beginning to end is to break the fellowship between God and human beings and to put human beings under his control. And I find it no accident that as Moses was up on the mountain, receiving the commandments and receiving the instructions on how to make the tabernacle, the people down below, uh, Satan comes in and gives them the go and causes them to go against God and to ask the to to, to create the, the, the golden calf. Remember the people were frustrated and afraid because Moses had been taken from them. Uh, they wondered what was going to happen to them. There they were, alone if you like, in the wilderness out of Egypt, but not in the promised land. And they're saying, what's going to happen to us? And the rebels amongst them came to uh, Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. And you find that uh, in the account of Genesis, uh, Exodus 32, they took the gold, which God had intended to make for the making of the tabernacle, and instead they made the golden calf and danced around it. 
And they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you up out of Egypt. And they see them dancing around the golden calf. And dancing around that golden calf is actually not going to bring them to God. It's going to take them right away from God. And you can see that this whole incident with the, the, the golden calf was Satan trying to fr- prevent what God wanted to do uh, through the creation of the tabernacle and creation of the way in which people could come into the presence of God. And so they were going after false gods and um, being taken away from God. And <clears throat> it was nearly the end of the process because God said, well, okay, you've gone so far, I'm afraid I'm just going to wipe you out and just make a people through Moses. And Moses intercedes and prays and uh, God is merciful and he forgives the sin and he goes, Moses goes back again to uh, the mountain and receives the uh, new tablets of stone and the details on the construction of the tabernacle which he then shares with the people and he commissions uh, the construction of it with the offerings made by the people. So God is merciful, God says I'm not going to wipe you out uh, and Moses said, if you wipe them out, then, you know, what are the Egyptians going to say? They brought them out with all this tremendous performance, bring them out of, through, of Egypt, and now they all die in the wilderness. Uh, it's a big failure. So God's not going to let that happen. And God disciplines the people, but he continues with his process to bring them into the promised land. And he gives Moses the instructions here for making the tabernacle. There's the tabernacle building, here's the outer court, and all the items of furniture within it, all of which have some purpose, and we'll be talking a little bit about that later, all of which in some point point us to Jesus. And in this we can see there is a whole typological significance of the Lord Jesus as the Saviour, as the one who brings us into the presence of God. And God gives the instructions on how to make it, and this is interesting passage in Exodus chapter 35, uh, Moses comes down from the mountain and speaks to the children of Israel and says, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he's filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting in, for setting in carving wood and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. And he's put it in his heart, the ability to teach in him and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, son of the tribe of Dan. He's filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and the, tap- and the tapestry maker in blue, purple and scarlet thread and in fine linen and of the weaver, those who do every work and those who design artistic gifts. And Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. And you see from this passage that, uh, you know, we'd think that making uh, an ark was not really spiritual work, but God says it is. He says, I've given you, filled them with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, wisdom and understanding, and in knowledge and full work, manner of workmanship. So the construction was done by the instruction of God and also by the people who were going to do it, who were then filled with the Holy Spirit, to give them the skill to make this uh, wonderful ark, uh, this wonderful tabernacle, which God had instructed them to make. So it wasn't just a chance building, and they were told to do it according to all of the instructions which God had given them. So God gave detailed instructions of how the ark, the uh, tabernacle was to be made. Find in the following chapter that the people give uh, of their substance, they give of their uh, belongings, they give of their gold, their silver, and all the things which they give to construct the tabernacle, that they give more than enough and God has to tell them to stop giving. Now some people ask, well, where did they get the gold and the silver from? Uh, If you read back in the book of Exodus, you find that as the Israelites were thrust out of Egypt, the Egyptians uh, gave them of their substance, so they gave them provisions, uh, and that was where they would have got the gold and silver from, and all the items which they were able to use then in the construction of the tabernacle. And as I said, in the golden calf incident, they started giving them for, to make the golden calf, which is obviously not what God wanted. So you can see Satan trying to, again, prevent what God, God is doing. And so we have the tabernacle. Uh, now the picture of the construction. Um, <coughs> the actual building was uh, 
done according to the instructions which are given in the chapters through 25 of Exodus up to 40. Tell us what it was going to look like. And it would be the dwelling place of the Lord. Uh, it was actually an oblong building about uh, covered with gold, roofed over with a cloth, covered by animal skins. The building was about 45 feet long, that's about 15 meters, by 15 feet, by 5 meters, and 15 feet tall. It had these golden covered boards from which the building was constructed, stood upright, and had four layers of material were thrown over the upright boards, forming the roof. The outer layer, layer of the material was animal skin, so the appearance was on the sides and the, uh, was rough and plain. So you have these animal skins covering it. Uh, there was a beautiful veil made from blue, purple, and scarlet and fine twisted linen, and cherubim skillfully worked into the material. The veil hung inside on the building on four gold-covered wooden posts standing on bases of silver. The veil was placed two-thirds of the way towards the far end of the building, partitioning, partitioning off a room, cubicle in proportion. This was the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place. We'll come back to that in a moment. And if you stood back, you could see the impression of a large fenced-off area with a fence all around it, uh, the fence uh, and the building rising up above it. And when it was dedicated, the glory of the Lord came down upon it. One interesting point which occurred to me from this is that on the outside, because of the animal skins covering it, it looked quite plain and not particularly attractive. So when you looked at it from the outside, you'd just see these animal skins, uh, and it wouldn't look particularly in attractive. When you go inside, you'd see all the beautiful things, the, the gold, the, the beautifully worked material. And that's uh, one of the types also which I see about the tabernacle and our faith in Jesus. Uh, when you look on the outside, sometimes it's not very attractive. And in fact, the central figure of the Christian faith is a man hanging on a cross, dying, shedding his blood. Uh, especially if you're a Roman citizen, the idea of someone uh, being crucified being the main point of your faith would be something particularly unattractive. And you could say there are certain things about the externals of Christianity which may not look attractive to people. But when you get inside, and you get inside through your understanding the meaning of that man dying on the cross, who is not just a man, he is the Lord of glory, dying on the cross to pay for our sins. When you get on the inside, then you have revelation of what's inside, which is beautiful beyond any possible description which we can have. But you have to get on the inside to understand it. And sometimes, as I say, you can look on the outside. Many people look on the outside and say there's nothing attractive about your faith, I don't want it. Uh, and you only understand it when you get on the inside, when you come to believe in Jesus, the Messiah. Okay, so when we read through the book of Exodus, we find that the work was completed and the tabernacle was consecrated to the Lord. So Exodus chapter 40 tells us how they built it. Then it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, on the first day of the month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony and partition off the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it. And you shall bring in the lampstand and the light, light its lamps. You shall also set the gold, the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up the screen on, for the door of the tabernacle. Then you should set the altar of the burnt offering before the door and the, of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You should set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water on it. You should set up the court all around and hang up the screen at the court gate. So they did all that. And then when they put everything in place, in verse 34, it says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the ta tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle and the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by 
day and the fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So you see, as they finished the construction of the building, done everything according to the pattern which God had given to them, then the cloud, the glory cloud, the Shekinah, comes into the tabernacle, and Moses is actually not able to minister in the tabernacle because it's filled with the glory of God. So again, you have this picture of God coming to dwell with them. The glory of God comes into the tabernacle. And the cloud, the Shekinah, is uh, in the Bible is often seen as the, the image of the presence of God amongst his people. <clears throat> so you have the glory cloud coming into the temple, into the tabernacle. Uh, I did say the temple, but of course when you read the construction of the temple in uh, 1 Kings, you find that exactly the same thing happens. And actually the temple is built on the same pattern as the tabernacle. So the tabernacle ta building uh, is reproduced when they build the tabernacle, when they build the temple, and in 1 Kings when the temp temple is completed and they dedicate it, then the glory cloud comes in again into the temple and they're not able to minister because of it. So there you have the tabernacle building, you have the uh, fence around it, you have the items of furniture, and there at the top you have the glory cloud. Perhaps quite a poor representation really, but we can't even describe what it must have been like to see that glory cloud come into the tabernacle and fill it with uh, God's presence. And the glory cloud does represent the presence of the Lord. Uh, so when it's in the midst of the presence of Israel, uh, as they have the glory cloud in the midst of their men, so they have God there present to guide them and to lead them. And we see from this passage that when uh, the Lord was going to move them on, then the, the cloud would move and the cloud would go before the children of Israel. They would dismantle the tabernacle because all this was made so that it could be uh, dismantled and then carried by the Levites to the next place and then constructed. Uh, that's another picture which you have of the tabernacle, which is also that it is a temporary building. It's not there to last. It's going to be taken down and then rebuilt, taken down, rebuilt. So they get into the promised land, then they would place it in Shiloh and be placed to go to worship. But it would be a temporary structure pointing to the eternal structure which is going to come through faith in Jesus the Messiah. But you have here the glory cloud coming upon it and filling the temple, filling the tabernacle. And that's also a picture of what happens when we come to believe in Jesus, because actually we want to have the glory of God in us. Uh, what does Paul speak about? He says about Christ in you, the hope of glory. So as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit comes into you, and you, God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the glory cloud coming into us by faith in Jesus. And we have in our picture, which I said earlier when we did talk on the Holy Spirit, that we have a three-part uh, nature of human beings. We have the body, the soul, personality, our will, our emotions, etc. And then we have the Spirit, the part of us which is made to be filled with the Spirit of God. And if we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us, then we're going to have order in our emotions, in our bodies, and we're going to have God dwelling within us to minister to us. And God's purpose in redemption is that we should be filled with the Holy Spirit to have God dwelling in us by his Spirit. So the picture of the glory cloud coming into the temple is a picture actually of the glory of God coming into our lives as we become the temple of the Holy Spirit and we have God living in us by Jesus Christ. And we need to have God in the center of our lives. That's if we want to have the order of God. Other interesting point is that as the construction comes about, you have the tabernacle there in the middle of the children of Israel. You have the priests and the Levites gathered around it, Moses and Aaron there uh, in the center. Then you have the 12 tribes of Israel gathered around in order. So as the, when the tabernacle was rested, that was how the plan would be. And again, you can see what that has is the picture of the God, the tabernacle in the midst of the tribes of Israel, so God dwelling with his people. Again, a picture of God wanting to dwell within us and to be uh, in the center of our lives, to guide us, to protect us, to give us his order. And if he's removed, if he's not there, then you have disorder and chaos. So the picture there of God's order with God in the center of his people, I think it speaks also about God being at the center of our lives, therefore giving us his order and guiding us into the way of truth. 
Now, the point about the tabernacle, that's the plan of the building. Um, you have the fence around it here. You have the outer courtyard with the items of furniture. I'll go through those in a moment. The holy place. Uh, and then you have the most holy place. One interesting point here is that you have one entrance, one way in. Uh, you have to come in through the entrance, and it's uh, built in God's way, and we have to come in God's way into his house. Uh, and just thinking about the one way in uh, reminds us that uh, if you want to climb in another way, you want to jump over the fence, it's not going to be allowed, and you'll be kicked out, basically. The only way you can come in is through the one way through the door here, which reminds us of Jesus' words in John chapter 10, where he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is the thief and the robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the thief, uh, shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he brings out his sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. And verse 7, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. Therefore, my father loves me because he, I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to take it, lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Jesus is the one way into the presence of the Lord. And he's made the way through his death, through his resurrection. And he says that you can't come in another way. If you want to jump over the fence uh, into the tabernacle, you'll be kicked out. Uh, you're a thief and a robber. You have to come through the one way, through faith in Jesus. And people today are looking for all kinds of ways they can come to God. And they're saying that my way is as good as your way. And I'm as good as you are. Well, that's not the point. The point is whether your way is acceptable to God. And everything about this tabernacle is telling us something about what God has planned, how God has made the way for us to approach him. And God doesn't actually change his terms. And a lot of people today would like God to change his terms and say that all roads lead to God. A lot of the church would say even that. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's one way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. We have to come through the one gate, uh, through faith in Jesus, the Messiah. And <clears throat> as you come into the tabernacle, so you come into the outer courtyard, and you begin to see the uh, different pieces of furniture there. The outer courtyard is in the open, um, and it's interesting, the tabernacle is actually in three parts. Uh, and it tells us something about the ways in which God has constructed it. And it all points us to Jesus. Uh, and in fact, the book of Hebrews tells us that the pattern of the tabernacle was shown to Moses by the Lord. And it was to be, as I've said already, a dwelling place of God in the human neighborhood. And it was an earthly figure of the temple of God in heaven. So it's divided into three parts. You have the outer part, the courtyard, surrounded by the linen fence. Uh, and you have the second and third areas, which are made inside the wooden structure, covered by, covered by the goat's hair and the uh, four layers of the material. And into this part, the priest would go to minister. Uh, generally, the people could not go into this, this part. And you came into the Holy of Holies, and in the Holy of Holies, uh, only Moses would go, uh, and the high priest on the Day of Atonement to offer the sacrifice in the Holy Place. And the Holy of Holies was actually separated from the Holy Place by the great curtain, the veil, which uh, separated it from the rest of the people. So only the priest, uh, the high priest and Moses could go into the Holy of Holies. In fact, in the it tells us that Moses went into the presence of the Lord there and God spoke to Moses face to face in the Holy of Holies. So it wasn't everyone could go in there and have a look and see what it was like. There were barriers. And of course, that speaks to us also about the fact that in, under the Old Covenant, there remained this barrier between the people and the Lord. 
But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, which symbolized that now the people, whether Jewish or Gentile, whether priests or not priests, everyone, wherever they came from, could come into the presence of the Lord through faith in Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, so it's actually speaking to us about our relationship with God. Now you have in the tabernacle, as I've said, the various items of furniture. And in order not to go into this in too great length, I'm just going to mention very briefly because there are a whole lot of things you can learn from each one of these pieces of furniture. The first thing which you come to is the altar of burnt offering, which is that one there. Uh, and the altar of burnt offering was where they would offer the sacrifice uh, to cover sin. So that speaks to us. The first thing which you come to encounter as you go in is the altar with the sacrifice. What's the first thing which you encounter when you come to faith in Jesus? Is Jesus dying on the cross as a sacrifice for the sin of the world. So the altar actually speaks to us of Jesus as the Savior who's died for our sins. The next thing you come to is the laver, uh, which is that one there. Uh, the laver. Uh, is the place to washing, so washing of the hands and the feet after they come through the uh, offer the sacrifice in order to go further. So the washing it speaks to us also of the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. So if you come to Jesus, uh, so you have come to faith in Jesus, and he's going to then wash you from your sins and bring you into a new relationship with God. So the laver speaks about the washing of regeneration from our sins. Uh, the next thing you come to is the table of the showbread. And I will speak about these things a bit in more detail at a uh, future time. But the table of the showbread, uh, there has the bread, the showbread on it. And that also speaks to us of the bread and the wine, the fellowship with God through the breaking of bread, and also through the, uh, the bread of life, Jesus himself being the bread of life, and the word of God being broken to us, which is uh, to feed us with the bread of life. The next thing you come to is the uh, lampstand. Uh, speaking of the menorah, which would light up the, the tabernacle, uh, which speaks to us also of Jesus as the light of the world, uh, giving us the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to give us new life, and to fill us with the Holy Spirit, and to give us the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to empower us with the Holy Spirit, to live our lives under the power of God. And the next thing you come, whoops, the next thing you come to is the... <coughs> altar of incense which is up there that one yeah the altar of incense which speaks to us of prayer and intercession and offering worship to the lord uh, as we come uh, through the holy place into the holy of holies and then when you come into the holy of holies you have the ark of the covenant with the mercy seat above it ark of the covenant which contains the covenant the uh, covenant of god the commandments and which is actually the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. And on the top of it, the mercy seat, which speaks to us of the atoning sacrifice, which was offered there uh, to bring peace into the presence of God. So it ends up again with a sacrifice in order to bring us into the presence of the Lord. So that's a very brief run through the tabernacle furniture. Actually, you could say a whole lot more about that. I will do in the future times. But when we look at this, uh, the New Testament actually tells us that all this is speaking to us about our redemption through Jesus. The book of Hebrews uh, makes the connection with what is in the tabernacle with the Lord Jesus. It tells us, uh, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the gold pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So the book of Hebrews was saying, well, I've just told you that all these things are Types typologically pointing us to Jesus as the one who's going to bring us into the presence of the Lord. 
Going on in that chapter in verse 11, it says, But Christ, Messiah, came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Uh, this passage only tells you why we don't need a tabernacle today, why we don't need a temple today, why we don't actually need priests today. And I'm not a priest. Uh, I'm telling you the word of God. We have a great high priest who is Jesus, the Messiah, who's come from heaven to redeem us and to make it possible for every person who repents and believes the gospel to come into the presence of God through faith in Jesus, to bring us into the new covenant. And the new covenant has actually replaced the old covenant. So there is a replacement which has taken place. Sometimes we talk about replacement theology. Now, God hasn't replaced Israel. Israel remains an entity before him. God has a purpose still for Israel. But God has replaced the way of uh, redemption under the old covenant with redemption now under the new covenant through faith in Jesus. And under the old covenant, you had the sacrifices of the goats and calves, uh, which were made in order to enter the holy place. Under the new covenant, we have the sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus, who shed his blood in order to redeem us. And through that sacrifice, every one of us can come into the presence of God through faith in Jesus. Therefore, he is the mediator of the new covenant mediator, the one who brings it to pass. So if today you want to come to the presence of God, and I guess you do because that's why you're here, you come through the mediation of Jesus Christ. He is the one who's made it possible that through that you can receive redemption from the transgressions under the first covenant. So all of us sin according to the law which is given by Moses, uh, come short of his glory. We need a mediator to bring us into the presence of God. The final mediator, the final covenant comes through Jesus, the Messiah. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So he's saying here actually that the tabernacle is somehow a copy of what is in heaven. It's a copy, but it's not the real thing. It's not bringing you actually into heaven. For that you need Jesus. And that's why Jesus had to come in fulfillment of prophecy. He says, Christ, Messiah, has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He would then have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As it is appointed to men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ has offered, was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. A great statement there of what Jesus came for and how this relates to the teaching of the Hebrew Scriptures of the Old Testament concerning the tabernacle uh, and why Jesus has replaced all of this. So actually we don't need this tabernacle now. It's a type, it's a picture which can point us to Jesus, but we don't actually need it because Jesus has come to fulfill the prophecy. He's come to offer himself and through his blood which was shed for us, uh, he has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Remember I said at the beginning that God wants to relate to us. Those of us who are seeking God want to relate to God. But there's a problem because of sin. It's a barrier which separates us from God. That barrier needs to be removed in order that we can have a relationship with God. When Jesus came and died on the cross, he took the punishment for the sin of the world so that we can be redeemed and so that we don't have to suffer the penalty of our sin, which is eternal judgment and eternal separation from God. He died, and as it says in this passage, it was appointed to men to die once, 
but after this, the judgment. One thing we can know about this life is that we're going to die. Uh, unless the Lord comes and takes us first, which is better. But even that is a form of death, because you're taken out of this body into a new body. But the fact is that this body which we're living in is not going to last forever. It's appointed unto man to die once. And notice that once as well. You only live once, you only die once. You're not going to be reincarnated as a frog or a snake or something else. You only live once, and the idea of reincarnation is a false teaching, <coughs> which has no basis in the scriptures. One life, one mediator, one savior, Jesus. <coughs> and <coughs> says, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Also, there is one redeeming act which Jesus made when he died on the cross, doesn't have to be repeated over and over again. If you know anything about Roman Catholicism, you may know that the doctrine of the Mass is that Christ is sacrificed every time the Mass is taken, and the priest has some power to create, the, recreate the, the, the bread into the body of Christ and the, the wine into the blood of Christ. So he's sacrificing Jesus over and over again. Wrong teaching. Jesus died once, and the, the <coughs> remembrance of the Lord is the remembrance of his death and resurrection, not re-sacrificing him. Christ died once. It was sufficient. He doesn't need to do it over and over again. Uh, <clears throat> and through his sacrifice, every person who repents and believes the gospel can come to the Lord. And it says he's going to come again a second time. This time not to die for our sins, but to bring redemption to those who believe in him and to bring separation between those who are lost and those who are saved. So coming back to the tabernacle, the holy place, if I can find the picture, all of this is actually a picture of our approach to God. You see that? And I said, I haven't time to go into the items of the, tab the furniture, which I will do next time, but each one of those items of furniture points us to some aspect of our approach to God through faith in Jesus. <clears throat> and the writer to the Hebrews has already told us how we can come to God in this way. And that God wants a dwelling place for his people here on the earth. And that's actually what the church is. If you and I believe in Jesus, we are the dwelling place of God uh, in this earth. And God wants the church to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he wants us to live our lives by the Holy Spirit. And he wants us to live our lives according to the pattern which he's given in, in his word. Just a Final point, I can get to it. Yeah. We do have to recognize that there is the sin problem. And this is what the tabernacle is speaking of, and above all, it's what Jesus is speaking of. We have a holy God, and we have sinful humanity. And we have a huge barrier here between God and humanity. What I've been trying to tell you is that God throughout the Bible is trying to cross that barrier so that we can come to God and we can have a fellowship and a relationship with him. But this chasm of sin is it's kind of impenetrable unless something is done to take it away. Uh, we can't earn our salvation. We can't do good works to cover that sin. We have to do, God has to do something himself. And of course, when Jesus came as the Savior, he came to die for our sins to make it possible that we can be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus. And he came to bridge that gap. God became man to dwell amongst us in order that we can be redeemed and we can come into a fellowship relationship with God. And every person who repents and believes the gospel has that separation there taken away. So there's now no longer this barrier, there's no longer this gulf which can't be crossed. It has been crossed through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he has paid the price, and when he died on the cross, he died so that we can be forgiven and we can come into the presence of God and have eternal life. And therefore, we have to repent of our sins, believe the gospel, and so be brought into the presence of God through faith in Jesus. <clears throat> and we have to respond by personally respond repenting and accepting Christ. I would guess that every person here is a believer, but there may be people even listening on the 
internet who are not believers. And if so, now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to make your choice to repent, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's just a prayer. And if you want to pray this, pray for salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died in my place, shedding his blood to pay for my sins and that he rose again from the dead to give me eternal life. Willing right now to turn from my sin and accept Jesus, the, the Messiah, as my personal Savior and Lord. I commit my life to you and ask you to send the Holy Spirit into my life to fill me, take control, and to help me become the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you, Father, for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. And Lord, we do pray that you would indeed fill us with your Holy Spirit and empower us to live the life that you want us to live. Thank you, Lord, that you want the church to be a dwelling place where you can come and dwell with us by your Holy Spirit. And we want you to come, Lord, in your power to fill us anew with your Spirit and to empower us to live our lives to your praise and glory. As we look out on the darkness of this present world, we thank you that you haven't left us comfortless, but you have sent the Lord Jesus to redeem us and that he is with us now always, even to the end of this age. So we pray you bless us and empower us and fill us with your spirit and enable us to go forward in this day to give praise and worship and honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that you've done the work. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the pattern of the tabernacle, but we thank you much more for giving us the new covenant through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.